Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. No matter where you're located in the world, the UCLA Center for Middle East Development would like to welcome you to our very third episode of a unique monthly series we are calling CMED Chat. My name is Salome Mahajar, I'm CMED's project manager, and we're all very excited to have you here with us today. This new project will engage charismatic guests who are from the Middle East and North Africa, or who are connected to the region in some capacity. We plan to bring you anyone from diplomats, activists, journalists, and policymakers, to artists, musicians, filmmakers, and many more guests who can help us dig deeper into an often misunderstood, complex part of the world. Our hosts and guests will sit down for one-on-one -on -one casual chats for at least 30 minutes. They will cover a variety of topics and highlight the many diverse voices and realities that enrich the colorful region we lovingly call Mina. All CMED Chats episodes will be recorded live and can be viewed on CMED's website or YouTube page within 24 hours of this broadcast. We will not be accepting audience questions for our live guests. However, if you have any logistics questions, feel free to let us know in the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. And without further ado, I will pass the microphone to Steve Zipperstein, a lecturer of public policy and global studies at UCLA and a senior fellow here at the UCLA Center for Middle East Development. Steve practiced law for more than 37 years in California, Washington, DC, and New York, New Jersey, and is the author of the recently published book, Law and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Trials of Palestine. His next book, Zionism, Palestinian Nationalism, and the Law, between 1939 and 1948 will be published later this year. Steve, take it away. Thank you so much, Salome. Welcome everyone. We're just absolutely honored to have Mickey Bergman with us today. Uh, many of you know Mickey from other CMED related activities, but much like Clark Kent and his alter ego Superman, Mickey also has a separate life, an amazing life, the life of a true superhero. Mickey is a pioneer in the field that we call fringe diplomacy, a term that Mickey himself coined. He's focused on working in very, very uh, dangerous places around the world to free Americans held in captivity in places like North Korea uh, and elsewhere. We're gonna hear a lot more about that as we move forward. Um, Mickey was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in 2019, and you saw him pictured on the opening screen, not just with the President of the United States and the Secretary of State, but with the Foreign Minister of Iran, with the King of Jordan, with the former leader of Myanmar. And we're going to hear a lot more about that uh, this morning. Mickey um, has become a very, very ubiquitous figure in the media uh, around the world and in the United States, media outlets relying on Mickey's expertise in places like North Korea, where he negotiated for the release of the American Otto Warren Beer, who was held captive there and unfortunately passed away. Mickey arranged for uh, the body of the late Otto Warren Beer uh, to be brought back to the United States. Um, and um, before I turn it over to Mickey to tell us about his experiences in the field of fringe diplomacy, I wanted to give you just a little taste of how the media relies on Mickey's expertise here he's asked about North Korea at the time when former President Trump was hoping for a diplomatic breakthrough. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, but let's take a look at just this short video clip from CBS News to give you an idea of Mickey's expertise. Go ahead. Mickey Bergman was involved with the negotiations that led to the release of American student Otto Warmbier. Warmbier later died of injuries sustained while he was held in North Korea. Mickey Bergman is vice president at the Governor Richardson Center for Global Engagement. He joins us now. Welcome to you, Mickey. Thank you. So what does the United States, you think, need to keep in mind when entering into negotiations with North Korea? Well, I think there are several things that that need to be uh, taken into account. Number one, and I actually think the president is right about it, uh, it's about creating a personal relationship. Uh, the North Koreans, the, the the negotiations with them are uh, are divided into two parts. The first one is the formal part. It happens across the table. Uh, it's harsh. It's 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 very formal. Uh, the second part is is not happening in those official meetings. It happens when you take a walk. It happens when you share a meal. It happens when you when you go. When I when I negotiated in North Korea uh, a year and a half ago, they took me to a dolphinarium show, and that's where we were talking. 
uh, you establish those personal relations, that's, that's, that's a part where the president is absolutely correct, I think, in, in assessing and getting this gut feeling of a personal relations, uh, relationship. I think that there was also not enough time for this summit in preparation to make it, to, to get a headway um, uh, before. So a lot of what we can expect and hope from, uh, from this is that initial contact and relationship between the two leaders. We go back well, what yes. tactics do you Okay, um, so that gives you just a sense. Mickey's been on television all over the world, as I said, um, on the radio. Uh, there was a very, very long article published in GQ magazine about Mickey's efforts in North Korea. Mickey, can you tell us a little bit, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking time to be with us. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this field of fringe diplomacy? Um, also, give us a little bit about your, about your background and then let's talk about some of your experiences. Uh, well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Simed, for, for having, the, uh, having me on this. Um, I, I have to, first, a disclaimer. I know it, it looks like I'm wearing exactly the same shirt as I did in the interview. It, it probably is right, but I do have a few of them, so it's not, it's not the same shirt exactly. Um, it, it, let me actually, uh, if, I, if I may, I, I want to take, to, to start with a little story uh, that is related, obviously related, related to, to the piece you just uh, aired here the, uh, from the interview. And, and it takes me back about five years ago. Uh, it was September of uh, 2016. So this was um, uh, uh, about two months before the elections in 2016. Um, and I found myself uh, in Pyongyang uh, at, the, uh, at the War Museum there. Um, and the War Museum in Pyongyang, they refer to it as the, as the War Museum, as the American War. We refer to it as the Korean War, obviously. Um, and I was walking there uh, in a guided uh, tour uh, and the museum is, is, is very harsh. I mean, it's, it, it, there is like wax um, uh, images of decaying American soldiers and pieces of ammunition of planes um, uh, and of tanks, uh, 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 very, very graphic um, uh, in it. And, and you're just walking through it. It's very, very somber. Um, and, uh, and you might wonder wh why was I in, in, in the museum there? And, and as was mentioned, as Steve mentioned, um, in the introduction, uh, in 2016, I was there in September. Uh, the informal reason for my visit um, uh, and my mission there was to try and negotiate with the North Koreans uh, the return of Otto Wombier, who was a, an American student that was in prison there. Um, uh, at that point, he was, he was in there for about um, uh, eight months. Uh, um, uh, but when you go to North Korea, you can't you can't just go publicly and say, yeah, I'm here to negotiate a political prisoner. First, because from their perspective, there's no such thing as a political prisoner, um, uh, but also because optics, it doesn't, it doesn't look good for them. So you have to have another reason, another um, uh, more public reason for why you're there. And, and from our perspective, uh, we had two of those. Uh, uh, one uh, was trying to negotiate and, and reignite a program that existed before between the United States and the North Korean militaries. And that was the uh, recovery and return of American servicemen uh, from the Korean War who are still there. Um, it's not very known, but uh, there's still about uh, 5,300 American soldiers that are still there since the war. Uh, these are the remains. Some of them are buried. Some of them are in crash sites. Um, it's a very significant program. And it's a program that is not only important for the Americans, it is also important for the North Koreans. So that was really the official reason why uh, we were there. Um, uh, the, uh, the third reason was the, that North Korea was hit by terrible floods just a, a few months before. Uh, and we were there trying to evaluate and, and provide some humanitarian relief. Um, so publicly, it was about remains. It, it was about uh, humanitarian relief. But we knew that uh, uh, behind the doors, uh, we're there to talk about Otto Wombier. Uh, and I had two individuals with me. Uh, one was Rick Downs who is the president of coalition of uh, American POWs and MIAs from the Korean War. Rick actually lost his dad. Uh, Rick was three. And uh, when he lost him, he went down with his plane, never to be recovered, even though we know where he crashed. Uh, that was Rick's first visit to North Korea. I took him with me because I needed somebody to humanize the issue with the North Koreans, and that he did very, very well. And the second individual that I took with me was a forensic anthropologist from Chico, California uh, named P. Wiley. Uh, and I had to bring P with me uh, because he was a civilian contractor 
with the Department of Defense who knew all the procedures of how to deal with remains. Um, and since I couldn't bring anybody official, the delegation was not a formal delegation, it was informal. I had to, to bring those expertise with me. So back to the museum. Um, and at the time, by the way, it was the new museum. It just opened um, six months before. It was buzzing. Um, uh, there were hundreds of students, of North Korean students, just walking through uh, um, uh, guided tours there. Um, and uh, uh, I even stepped on the USS Pueblo, which is a ship, a Navy ship that was captured by the North Koreans back in the, in the 70s. Um, it, 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 and you might wonder if I, if I was there to negotiate the release of Otto Wombier or Remains or Humanitarian, why on earth was I in, in, the, uh, in the museum? And the reason is because the negotiations in North Korea are very different than anything that we're, that we're used to. Um, Stephen, if you and I go to negotiate on something, the first thing we do is that we meet and we sit around the table, we share our opening statements um, uh, uh, and, and argue a little bit, and then we break. Uh, we break, reassess, and we come back to, to round two. Uh, that's not the case in North Korea. Uh, in North Korea, things are, are, are quite different. Uh, and the reason they're different is because my negotiating partner in North Korea, in this case was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, a, a man named Han, um, it, he has no authority to negotiate uh, uh, with me. Uh, he's a conduit, meaning he can only uh, um, uh, convey the messages that the leader uh, sends to me through him. Um, in other words, if I meet with him before he knows exactly what I'm there to negotiate, he won't be able to answer or respond to me. Respond to me. So when I go there, the first three days is filled with going to the museums, look, I mentioned in the interview, going to the Dolphinarium, having meals with two minders uh, uh, who work for the foreign minister, who their job in those days is to dig for me or mine from me exactly what it is that I'm there uh, to negotiate, what I'm authorized to give, so they can write a memo to their boss, the vice minister, to tell him this is exactly what Mickey is going to present in the official meeting. And then their boss needs to send out to his boss, the leader, and his boss can then tell him, here's what you're going to respond to Mickey. And only then we can actually have the meeting. Um, so that's why I, I was in that, in that museum. And as I was walking through this museum, we had this uh, uh, officer that was giving us the tour, um, a, a, a very knowledgeable uh, um, uh, individual. And she, it, she casually mentions to us as we walk through um, the number of uh, uh, Koreans that died in the war. Uh, and I know, uh, uh, you know, uh, people listening to this cannot actually jump in, but I, I, I think to yourself, if you can imagine how many Koreans actually, or if you know how many Koreans died in that Korean war, um, uh, because when she gave the, the number, it stunned me. The, the number was four and a half million. So four and a half million Koreans died in that war. At the time, by the way, I didn't have Google over there to check it, but I verified after, it's true. It's four and a half million Koreans died. It's, it's North Koreans and South Koreans together, but from their perspective, it's exactly the same people. They're Koreans, four and a half million people. Um, and when she gave me that number, uh, I felt a punch to my stomach uh, because I've been working North Korea issues at that point for about six years, and it never occurred to me that number. Um, and in my mind, immediately at, at the point when she was telling it, I was running the timeline, thinking, wait a minute, the Korean War happened about a decade after the Holocaust. The number, I know it's not the same, and I have to qualify it. This is not systemic killing. It was war. But the sheer number, four and a half million people, um, it, it is awfully big and awfully familiar. And as an Israeli born and a Jew, I know what that means to me, three generations down from it. I know what it means for everything, every fiber of my being and growing up and knowing about that and knowing my family being impacted by it and everybody's families being impacted by it. So it dawned on me how significant that war is uh, to the North Koreans. And then I also add to that as an Israeli, as a, as a Jew, I had reconciliation with Germany. I have Holocaust Memorial Days, international and, and national in Israel. There's Holocaust Memorial Museums in every capital. And it, it, 
the North Koreans never had, I'm not talking about an apology or anything, but just an acknowledgement of this. And, and that struck me uh, in a very profound way um, uh, in that museum. And, and so I zoom forward now three days uh, after this visit, and I'm sitting there with the uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, for that actual meeting of negotiations. And he starts and he's giving me all the big rhetorics that the United States is the source of all evil and we try, we're trying to kill the leader um, and all of that. And I'm, I'm familiar with it, that, that, that I just need to let it roll and, and wait my turn. Um, and, and when it was my turn, I, I told the vice minister, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to go into my talking points and into, into what we're here to talk. But, but I have to tell you that your guys took me to the museum. And I told him the story uh, of when I, what it felt for me when I heard that number. And I told him, look, I'm, I'm Jewish. I, I, I now understand in a way that I didn't before just the level of mistrust that exists between you and me. Um, and I said, you know, most Americans, when those who even think about the Korean War, they think about it as this little war that happened between World War II and Vietnam. Um, uh, uh, but they never, uh, they never think about it in, in, in those in those ways. And and I, it, it, I did that. I shared that because I wanted to kind of break the formality of the meeting, and I wanted to share with him to, some empathy. And um, uh, so 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 he understands that I'm getting him much more on this. Um, and, and that completely broke the official meeting. It changes the it changed the whole dynamic. And, of the meeting and helped us actually move forward. And, and I'm telling you that story, not because it's, you know, it's this heroic story or anything like that. It's because I want to emphasize two things. One is technical. And that is that before we even ever talk about international relations and, and, and what we want to do in policy, we have to try and put ourselves and understand the fundamentals in this case of North Korea. Uh, and of the North Koreans, because we, you know, every audience I ask, I, you know, I'll ask you, Steve, oh, what should we do with North Korea? They'll have a million ideas on policies, um, but very few people, especially in the United States, can answer the question, why do the North Koreans hate us so much? It, it, it just, it never occurs to us to think about it. Uh, and I, I need to make a distinction here. There's a distinction between empathy and sympathy. Um, uh, empathy is when you understand how somebody's thinking and how they're feeling and where they're coming from. Sympathy is when there's alliance between yours and theirs objective. And I'm not exercising sympathy here. I have no, no allegiance with the North Koreans and their objectives, um, but I am exercising empathy. So, so that's the first reason. The second reason is because I really want to, to start us off in this conversation in something that is so important to me and that is the, the power and importance of emotional intelligence in international relations and in negotiations. And it's true about international relations, it's true about business, it's true about your own family and your friends uh, as well. And just to, to clear that, I, 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 when I think of emotional intelligence, I think about it as, as, as your ability to recognize and understand um, emotions in yourself and in somebody else. And, and then your ability to use those, that awareness to either manage your own behavior or manage your relationship. So it's four different planes, self-awareness, self-management, awareness in others and, and, and management of, of, of relationships. And, and I don't think we actually spend enough time with that. We have graduates, including from UCLA, including from Georgetown University where I teach, um, who are experts in national interest. They can analyze that, they can figure out strategies from it, um, uh, but that's just part of the game. Uh, it's a big part of the game that is the personalities and, and the emotional side of things. So we saw a photograph of you and uh, former New Mexico governor, your colleague, Bill Richardson, former secretary of energy, standing alongside the foreign minister of Iran, Mr. Zarif. Can you talk about your experiences uh, with him and in that country and how uh, this concept of emotional intelligence has uh, played into your dealings with the Iranian government. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, thank you for for, for that. Uh, and let me before I jump into in, into into the riff, just to give a context of how Governor Richardson, uh, uh, comes to who I work for, and I've been working with, I guess, since two thousand five. So it's been uh, it's been quite a while. Um, a, a, a part of fringe diplomacy that you mentioned uh, is really the 
the exploration of the space that goes beyond what official government's relationships, what their mandates and what their authority is in international relations. And it really relies on the, uh, on the assumption that we as individuals, as businesses, as academics, as artists, um, share a similar goal of having a peaceful, prosperous and, and, and stable world. But we sometimes ironically have more flexibility than governments do. And we can do things that are not contained by this choreography of diplomacy and processes. And that to me is mainly that human layer. And so there's two main activities of what we do within fringe diplomacy. The first one is engagement and the second one is intervention. And intervention is, is mainly what I do with Governor Richardson at the Richardson Center. Um, uh, it manifests itself a lot and most of the times in the negotiation, the release of political prisoners uh, or wrongfully detained uh, individuals. And everybody loves those interventions because they're quick, they're sexy. Wolf Blister does a, does a special on you. Uh, you get interviewed on CBS. So like, but in order to have those, uh, uh, in order to be able to do those successfully, you have to spend a lot of time building relationships, building trust before there is a conflict. And so that puts me into the engagement part of the work that we do and which takes a lot of my time um, uh, we do genuine engagement before there's a, a, a prisoner in some of the potential hotspots, be it Iran, be it Cuba, be it, um, uh, uh, we did Lebanon, we did Myanmar. Um, uh, we have a variety of those and we typically take, the way we do those is that we go to the, to the local uh, community, we ask them for their priorities, their vision, what they want to do with their community. And then we try to, um, uh, to curate a group of Americans that can go there, not to teach, not to not to you know to show up as if oh yeah we know how to do it and, and let us tell you how to do it but actually peer to peer and talk through the challenges and talk through the shared experiences and that has been extremely useful to us in building those relationships of trust because when you actually uh, respond to something that somebody asks you then they trust you and and they know they, they understand your intentions so it, with Richardson I focus a lot on the on the political. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, prisoners and the negotiations. So that brings me a little bit to, to, to Iran and the story of that uh, behind that picture. Um, uh, uh, again, it was around uh, September. This is uh, under Trump's presidency. So about be September before the pandemic. Um, uh, so I guess uh, almost two years ago, um, uh, almost, almost two years ago, I think. Yeah, I guess. I'm getting confused with the pandemic in years now. Um, uh, but we were asked by two American families um, uh, who have their loved ones uh, in, in Iran, Chiu um, uh, Wang, who was a Princeton PhD student, and Michael White, who was a former Marine uh, who was in prison in Iran. And by the way, we work, we're non for profit, non government. So we work when, when families ask us to work. That's our mandate. And we collaborate with government, but we don't work for the government. It gives us that kind of flexibility. Um, and, and for a while, we tried to help uh, on the Iranian prisoners, but, uh, but we couldn't get anywhere um, until we, we figured out how to meet with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif in one of his visits to the UN in September. Um, and, uh, and we sat with him in the room. Um, uh, uh, you know, and he's a very, those of you who, who have met him and seen him, he's a very charming, charismatic individual. Um, uh, and he told us, look, I don't understand. I, I came to Donald Trump back in April with a proposal for a global exchange of prisoners. I know Donald Trump wants to bring back Americans. We proposed this global exchange in which all prisoners will be released. And he shut us down. Um, it, it, and in the conversation, I, I, I told him that I think he misunderstood the president of the United States. Um, it, you know, we're nonpartisan, but I, I, I was, I have to admit, I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, uh, to, to say the least. Um, but in this meeting, I had to try and make sure that uh, Foreign Minister Zarif understands uh, why his mission was not successful. And I told him, look, you're right, Donald Trump genuinely wants to bring back Americans, but he does not want to appear as if he's giving anything in return. That goes against everything he stands for. Um, so any suggestion by you to do a global exchange in which he pays something back in return for getting Americans is just dead upon arrival. And, um, and Zarif looked at me at the governor and said, so, so we can't start anything. I said, no. 
instead of this kind of deal, what we need to do is we need to start it and to spark it with one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, one by one cases. And the way to do it is not that the United States is paying something in return, but finding what we refer to as mutual humanitarian gestures. Um, uh, and so we needed to identify something that the Iranians uh, can feel comfortable getting, which is a humanitarian gesture, not a, an exchange, um, and then they'll release one of the Americans and then we can uh, move on to the next one. Uh, and that changed completely the formula. And from that point, we actually, the, the, the negotiations were accelerated and, and, and went really, really quickly. We arrived at the formula, uh, we understand the Iranians, uh, it, something very important to them is symmetry. They want to always feel like they're equals um, at, at the table, which, which is absolutely, you can understand why. Um, so if we were asking for a release of a, an academic uh, in, in Tehran, they were looking for an academic in the US, an Iranian academic that needs to be released too. Took us some time, we identified the individual, um, uh, built it up. Ironically, Steve, then uh, the negotiations with the Iranians were actually easier than the negotiations with the Trump administration, because then we had to convince the Trump administration to do it. Um, and over there, while the White House and National Security Council was for it uh, initially, um, uh, two weeks after our initial, yes, let's go do it and us, us, us planning, uh, they kind of went silent on us. And, uh, and we had to kind of dive in because silence means that you have bad news, but you don't want to share it. Um, uh, so we dove in and we, we, we learned that the Department of Justice and the Department of State were against it. And when asking why, the white the NSC uh, individual didn't know. So I asked them, well, is it okay for us to try and figure it out? So we went all the way to Attorney General Barr at the time, um, met with him and, and, and heard two reasons for why what we proposed was, uh, uh, was a non-starter for the Department of Justice. Both reasons were absolutely legitimate uh, in terms of the, the independence of the judicial system, the, the, uh, the, the foreign exchange, but that allowed us to tell them, hey, we understand, we, we under and, and it's logical what you're saying, give us some time, let us renegotiate, restructure the deal to address those th two things. And we were able to do that. It required some flexibility from the Iranians, which they agreed to. Um, a, a, it also required us going down to negotiate with the a, a prosecutors of the Iranian in Georgia to figure out a plea bargain that will be acceptable uh, and then make sure that the Iranians are okay with that. So we did all of that, we packaged it, the Department of Justice actually approved it. Um, uh, and then uh, the State Department, there was a, a special envoy at the time, it was Brian Hook, who was against it because it stood against everything that he believed in in maximum pressure. And um, uh, when he realized that the judge already signed on it from the US and it was happening, he basically uh, four days in advance of our scheduled exchange, or shouldn't say exchange, of the, the, the sequence that would lead for the, for the releases, he took over, um, uh, told the Iranians not to work with the Richardson Center. He will provide the, the Iranian um, and they will provide the American and they'll, be, they'll do the exchange. And by doing that, he violated the two things that the Department of Justice asked us not to do, um, but he also harmed our ability to do the next release. So instead of doing it within a month, it took us additional six months to get Michael White uh, released as well, which again, we had to almost uh, uh, play reverse psychology with, uh, with State Department in order to get it done. Amazing, uh, absolutely amazing. This is, by the way, an example of, of when I wish the chat were really working because I would love to see what people would be chatting about this. Um, Mickey, a couple of months ago, uh, you had an audience with the Pope in the Vatican. Um, can you tell us what led to that and what the Pope was like in person? Um, he, I'll, I'll do the, the, the in-person thing first because I, it was, was my first visit with him. Um, uh, and uh, uh, of course with Governor Richardson, I, it's not like the Pope is going, oh yeah, Mickey, let's come and chat. Um, uh, he asked us actually uh, um, uh, to help him on, on something that is important to him regarding his, his own teachings and his own messages, um, uh, which unfortunately I cannot, I, I cannot share here. Uh, but I can tell you that um, in the pictures, um, uh, uh, he always looks a little bit somber and, and, and slouching. Um, in person, it's a very different 
person. He's very youthful, um, a, 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 a very jovial, very sharp, a, really, really passionate about the Middle East, by the way, uh, and our region, um, a, a, and want to basically find ways to deploy his soft power to, to, solve, uh, to solve the issues. And, uh, but you can see in his presence that you're in the presence of, of somebody who's very, very spiritual. Obviously, I'm Jewish, I'm not Catholic. Um, uh, funny enough, I was the only Jew and the only non-Catholic in the meeting. Uh, uh, we're a group of five and, and, uh, and, uh, and the governor was joking. It's like, oh, you're, you're a Jew. You shouldn't even be in that meeting. And, and, and the comment was uh, by the Pope saying, well, actually, he's the most important guy here because converting him is extra points. Um, but that's kind of the, the kind of guy uh, he is. Let me just uh, interrupt for a second. I'm reminded by the staff that those of you that would like to uh, post a question, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is available if you want to type a question, and we may have time to get to a couple. Uh, go ahead, Mickey, with the Pope, please. Oh, I, that was my, uh, just my, my kind of insights into, uh, into the Pope. Okay. Um, so we talked about North Korea. We talked about Iran. We've just talked about the Vatican. Uh, you've been active elsewhere around the world, of course. And two places I thought would be of interest uh, to our audience, of course, Russia, um, where there's been some back and forth involving you and, um, and again, the uh, U.S. administration, the past U.S. administration. Uh, if you could talk about that and also Venezuela, a very, very important and interesting place right now. Yeah, um, so in, in both of these places, we're, we're heavily involved. By the way, just to put things in perspective, there, there are uh, they're, they're the upper of uh, upper 50s uh, is the number of current cases that are uh, of Americans that are being considered uh, wrongfully detained um, uh, worldwide at this moment. Uh, we think there's more, but that's the official determination uh, by by the U.S. government. Um, uh, there, we don't only work on behalf of Americans. We also work on behalf of the internationals. Again, it's just happens to be that we work most for Americans because that those are the families who know about us and so they approach us. Um, uh, in Venezuela, I'll start there, there's, there, there are nine Americans that are wrongfully detained. Uh, 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 anybody who's familiar with it, there's the Citco Six, which is six executives of the Citco company that have been detained three and a half years ago uh, as a part really of the opposition, Maduro and his opposition fights over control of the company. Um, uh, 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 there's two American former Green Berets, um, uh, uh, Luke Denman and Aaron Berry, uh, who, were, um, uh, uh, who were sentenced for 20 years in Venezuela after they were caught there. They were actually in Colombia uh, training Venezuelans uh, over there, uh, but somehow were, ended up in Venezuela, even though they never intended to, um, and were accused of trying to assassinate the president. Um, uh, and then there is Matthew Heath, who's a former Marine, uh, who actually was in Colombia doing business and, and, and the personal stuff, and what appears to have been kidnapped in Colombia by criminal elements and then sold down uh, to Venezuela, where he was accused of single-handedly attempting to blow up refineries, which is obviously not, not something that he could do. Um, uh, uh, all these nine Americans are there, and we've been working on behalf of their of their families um, uh, in the middle of this pandemic in July of last year. So in pandemic before, uh, before the vaccines, we actually were in Venezuela. We met with President Maduro trying to figure out how to, uh, um, uh, how to resolve this. Um, uh, we we're able to get the Citco 6 into house arrest, um, which was a gesture that Maduro did after, um, uh, first after our visit, then he put them back in jail, then after um, uh, uh, President Biden took office. He did it as a gesture of, of goodwill uh, towards Biden. We're still working because the problem with house arrest is that it's reversible. Um, uh, it's much better. The families are much happy, but still they want them back home here. Um, uh, uh, and in Venezuela, uh, the, the, this visit was fascinating to me because, and I'll say something, it, it, with every culture, you try and understand how they negotiate and what are the different things. So we talked about the North Koreans and how they negotiate because of their hierarchy there. We, we mentioned about the Iranians, how they like the symmetry of this. I can tell you when I negotiated or mediated, I shouldn't say negotiated, mediated between Hamas and Israel on the deal of uh, bringing back Gilad Shalit, a, a soldier that was kidnapped years ago. Um, I've learned that Hamas, they, they set up their, their, the goalposts 
those goalposts will just not move. And you can think you can negotiate with them, but you're negotiating with yourself until you agree or disagree with their position. Um, uh, with the Venezuelans, it's a different game, uh, mainly because the goalposts move. They constantly move according to, to, to the wind and according to where, where we are politically. So not only do you need to figure out um, a, a, what a deal is, but you need to figure out at the right moment and execute it very, very quickly in order to, to get it, um, to be able to, uh, to get it done. And that's, that's something that is, that is very different. I have to also admit that the negotiations with North Korea, uh, with, uh, with uh, Venezuela happening during the pandemic are very different than anything I've ever experienced because despite a physical meeting there once, it mainly goes to WhatsApp. Um, and I don't speak Spanish, but I'm negotiating with the, you know, at some point, the vice president of, of Venezuela over this. So it's not only WhatsApp, it's WhatsApp on Google Translate. Um, and it's a very different style. You can't have nuance. You have to be very, very short, very specific questions, short questions and move it very, very slowly that way. Oh, so so that, that's Venezuela. Sorry, I, I know I, I, you asked about Russia too. Russia, there are two Americans, Paul Whelan and, and, and Trevor Reed that have been there for a while, both sentenced for uh, 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 terms of about 13 to 18 years between them. Um, uh, uh, both of them wrongfully detained. Both of them were, were captured as an opportunity of having an American. Uh, one is for espionage, Paul Whelan, uh, supposedly. Um, uh, the other one was actually because he was there with his fiance who's Russian and got drunk in a New Year's um, uh, party and was arrested for being drunk, but sentenced for 15 years. Um, uh, so obviously what they're trying to do, both of them are former Marines. Uh, Trevor Reed was actually a former presidential guard for Obama. Uh, um, and so uh, the Russians are very clearly asking for something in return. Uh, the two governments have a hard time negotiating over that because there's so much other stuff on the bilateral that you can't isolate the issue for them. That's where we can come in. So we stepped in again on behalf of the families and we said, look, we're not government. So don't talk to us about bilateral stuff, humanitarian. How do we do this? How do we solve this? Um, uh, because it, it, both the president of the United States and the president of Russia do not want to be asked by the media, what do you do about the prisoners? There's no good answer for that. The only answer is to actually get it resolved. And so we've been advancing with them. Um, uh, uh, again, a series of gestures, what we would take a series of gestures of a, a humanitarian gestures that will be uh, that would lead to the return of the Americans. It's an ongoing uh, uh, um, uh, work that I, I I hope will will be resolved before the end of this year. But because uh, I think the summit, despite the harsh rhetoric that came out of the summit between uh, President Biden and President Putin, uh, on this issue, I think we've made progress. Okay. Um, we just have a few minutes left, a few short minutes, and we've got a number of really terrific questions. Uh, let me just ask a couple of them. Um, one um, uh, from a federal judge in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is asking about the role of teleconferencing in fringe diplomacy. You, you emphasize the importance of personal relationships, but we are in a pandemic still um, uh, with the Delta variant and so forth. Uh, and then second, uh, another question from here in my town of Santa Barbara, someone asking, to what extent when you conduct fringe diplomacy, are you really acting on behalf of governments as opposed to private families or private interests? Um, do your uh, interlocutors on the other side, whether the North Koreans or the Russians or the Iranians, the Venezuelans, do they view you and Governor Richardson as really kind of secretly representing the US government or do they view you in fact as, as a purely private um, uh, negotiator? All right. Let me start with the last question, and then you'll remind me the first one, and we'll we'll, we'll jump with that. The, the last question, um, uh, it's a great, it's a it's absolutely a great question because it it fits exactly within the kind of gray area. From our perspective, the, there is no um, uh, uh, there there is absolute clarity in that. We do not represent government, uh, not the U.S. government, nor any any government. Um, uh, our our only fiduciary fiduciary responsibility is to the families because we are working on their behalf. Um, uh, again, at no cost to them, of course, but that's they're the ones that give us the mandate. Um, and so we're very, very clear with that from our end when we go and we say, hey, we're not the government, 
We're non for profit. We work on behalf of the families. Uh, that helps us a lot to get through the door and to have those conversations. That doesn't mean that the captors necessarily believe us. Um, uh, because from a lot of these places, especially places, and you know, most of the places that we work for are not exactly uh, uh, democratic uh, um, um, uh, governments, uh, they, don't, they don't accept the fact that there's such thing as non-government, especially since Governor Richardson, even, even though he's not in government, the title stays governor. And we use it because we know exactly what the impact is. So for our perspective, the fact that even though we are clear to them, hey, we don't represent the government, the fact that they might think that when they give us a message, it goes directly to the government helps us. And, and in truth, we, we, we do convey messages um, and that's absolutely legitimate, but, but, but we, we're very clear that they know that we're not representing government. We don't negotiate on behalf of the government. Uh, we're there on behalf of family. So it is, uh, we're clear on our end, but we also are very, very aware that it's not that clear, re clearly received. And that's fine because it gives us that that flexibility or that space to be able to explore things. But um, we certainly cannot uh, and will not negotiate on behalf of a U.S. government uh, on these things because if we do that, then the, then we have we're nothing different than what their own uh, people and diplomats can do. Um, so that's answering the second question. Remind me the first question. Teleconferencing. Yeah. Tele. Oh. So I mentioned, I mentioned the, the negotiations in uh, um, with Venezuela that right. ended with WhatsApp uh, because yes, uh, look, is, the best is in person. Zoom like this is, I guess, second best, but the North Koreans, the Iranians and the Venezuelans, they don't do Zoom. They won't Zoom with us. So it's either phone calls, texts, and um, uh, sometimes it's signal uh, because there's this idea that signal is safer um, uh, I, I, I have my technical doubts about that. Um, uh, I, I assume no privacy in any of the conversations that we have. Um, uh, but we try, look, uh, even in Zoom, like we're, we're doing this and I teach in Georgia and I teach emotional intelligence in international relations at Georgia University. I sit last year in a Zoom. I can see the students, they can see me, but I can't see when they're looking at each other. Um, and, and that is, in, if you think about it, when you sit in a meeting and you meet with... A, President Maduro, but his vice president is sitting there, his foreign minister is sitting there. When we say something, I don't only look at Maduro, I then look to see their response to each other, how they're looking at each other. Is there a nod? Is there something, that an acknowledgement there? All of that is missing in, tele, uh, in teleconferencing. So the, the short answer is it's been devastating to our ability to actually advance on the, on, on the layer that the emotional layer that I talk about so much, that I emphasize so much. Um, at the same time, you know, we, we don't leave any opportunity on the table. So COVID-19, a, a, a tragic pandemic offered opportunities to release Americans. Michael White from Iran was released uh, um, uh, based on an argument that we made on COVID-19. He did contract COVID-19 in prison in Iran. Um, and so we, 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 we structured that one as a medical evacuation, not a release. And we had a medical evacuation done from the US in a similar way. Um, so we take opportunities of everything we, we, we can because we need to create leverage when we really, we don't have any. Um, uh, but yeah, this, I, I'm very happy to be starting to meet people in person again, right now. So, and I know next week you might be in Myanmar or you might be in Rome or you might be in Moscow or you might still be at your home in Washington DC depending upon what happens but let me ask you the last question we have one minute left Mickey you referred a few times to your the fact that you are Jewish um, and yet we see you negotiating between Israel and Hamas we see you um, in Lebanon Jordan Iran uh, you served in an elite in an elite Israeli military unit during your military service to what extent does the fact that you're an Israeli-born American, a Jew, do, do any of the parties in the Middle East that you talk to, do they care about that? Is it an advantage or a disadvantage or just neutral? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you two stories on this very quickly. The first one, funny enough, traveling to North Korea in my first visit, so not the Otto Wombier one, but the, a, a, a few years before I went there uh, with Governor Richardson and actually with Eric Schmidt, who was the chairman of Google at the time, uh, we had another American prisoner there, Kenneth Bay, that we were working on getting out. 
and somebody said, oh my God, aren't you terrified of going to North Korea? And I, I said, actually, when I go to North Korea, um, uh, the reason they hate me there is because I'm American, not because I'm Israeli or Jewish. So that's kind of a, re a nice relief for me um, uh, from the typical travels. Um, it, more, more, more seriously, uh, it does have an impact. It's not, I don't think it's helpful. It's helpful in the way that I understand the Israeli psyche pretty well. Uh, we can spend hours talking about comparing that to, to other people, peoplehoods um, uh, uh, with that. But, but um, uh, I'll tell you with, with the Iranians, look, my accent is very clear. Anybody listening to this within a second know that I'm Israeli, even if you haven't looked at my, at my, uh, um, uh, at my bio. Um, uh, uh, so there's no reason to hide it. I actually do believe in, in negotiations. You have to be genuine and authentic to your personality. It's very important. But, you know, if you hide something, you, you, like, you can't be trusted. So, uh, so I, I, lean, I, I lead with this, and, and it's fine. The Iranians know my background. They don't meet with somebody before re researching anyway. Um, uh, the problem that I, that I uh, got with the Iranians was, uh, not when we were negotiating, but actually after we negotiated, because uh, somebody decided it was going to be a good idea to out me publicly, based on that picture with Zarif, as a former Israeli uh, soldier, they made it into a former Mossad, I, I'm not a Mossad agent, even though if, if I was, I probably would say I'm not, but anybody who knows me <laughs> knows that, the, that, that that cannot be further from the truth. But outing me that way, not in order to harm, harm me, but in order to attack Vice, uh, 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 Foreign Minister Zarif, that actually uh, hurt our ability to, my ability to negotiate. So um, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the outing of that was done by Israelis, which didn't make me happy at all of this. Um, uh, but generally speaking, they, again, talking to Hamas uh, uh, people, they, once they get to know you, once they understand, that, again, it's not, I don't pretend to be their friends. I don't pretend to, to align myself with their objectives. They know it very clearly. But we do talk at the same time from understanding where we're coming from, what is it that we're feeling. If we, we absolutely don't justify it, uh, 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 that actually creates uh, authenticity and, and trust in a way that you can't create otherwise. So it's not an advantage, but it's also, uh, you know, it's not a deal breaker in most cases. Great, Mickey. Um, we do have a few more questions. We don't have time, unfortunately, but we're going to compile the questions and uh, perhaps you can take a look at them, send the answers to us, and then we will email them to the individual questioners. I'm sure that they would love to hear your responses to their questions, and I don't want to leave them unanswered. But unfortunately, our time is up. Mickey, let me thank you so much for your generosity, taking time to share just the tip of the iceberg of your amazing, incredible superhero life with us. And you really are a superhero. Our sincerest congratulations to you on your incredible work. I know that we will see you on the stage uh, in Oslo accepting the Nobel Prize someday in your life. And in the meantime, uh, we wish you all the very, very best in your endeavors and we'll be following you very, very closely in the years ahead. But we do have some upcoming programs from the UCLA Center for Middle East Development. They're here on the slide. Uh, our next program, episode four, uh, is on August 25th, uh, hosted by uh, Manny Jad, the famous, the world famous uh, Manny Jad um, from the Center for Middle East Development uh, with her guest, Hala Espandiari. Um, and uh, stay tuned for further announcements of further upcoming events. In the meantime, thank you, Mickey. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to our staff, Salome, for the amazing job today. And we'll see you next time. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.